Success is not sexy. No. It's not. It's crazy how mundane and how it's a literally a habit. Welcome to the Disruptance Podcast. Here are your hosts, Eric Forney and Michael Bounds. Every week on the show, we aim to disrupt the way real estate agents and entrepreneurs think about life and business in order to be more profitable and productive. And this week, Mike, I want to disrupt the way you think about what matters. And that's because the headlines you read aren't the real story. And yet most of the time we confuse the flashy headline or the succinct, simplified narrative and think that it's actually um, the true and full story. And so we often uh, look at social media and we see these like grand uh, events or these big manifestations of a lot of really hard work and think that somehow um, what we see on social media is like driving results when we look at business. And yet what I found is that we over, uh, we actually like over uh, compensate for the things that are we think are big or um, matter more in leadership. And we oftentimes overlook all of the little things that add up to the big outcome. And so I want to dive in today to what really matters in leadership. What are those tiny levers that create big outcomes inside of a business for an entrepreneur um, is so that we can start to really unpack how someone builds a business and focuses on the things that matter the most. It's not the three pointer to, to win a game that matters. It's the team going 90% from the free throw line in the first four quarters of the basketball game that actually sets up the person to hit that game winning three. When you, when I talk about not everything mattering, um, or some things mattering disproportionately more, what comes to your mind? Uh, we, we oftentimes focus on what the big teams are doing or what big agents are doing. And um, we don't focus on like, for example, I always hear brand. Everybody focuses on like the brand when in all reality, if you go to work every day and you bring your lunch pail, the brand will take care of itself. A lot of it is just doing the fundamental things day in, day out then the brand develops itself, if you will. So I, that's typically what I'm, what I think of. Well, and that's an interesting thing that you talk about because you know, brand is such a bastardized concept, I right. think for most people, because, um, <laughs> you know, there's this, there's this blending between brand and marketing and right. advertising and oftentimes even in our world, like lead generation. Right. And so, um, in, in my mind, I, I think the best example to think about when we, when we utilize the, the word brand is Ritz Carlton. Right. And so the question that I always ask everyone is, is what is the brand of Ritz Carlton? Right. And what does the logo look like? What, what, what is the, you know, what's the font? What is the branding associated with Ritz Carlton? And nobody ever seems to bring up the fact that Ritz Carlton is a pitchfork and a lion's head. Because that's what no one thinks of when they think about yeah, Ritz Carlton. I don't, the brand. I, I don't even know what their logo. It looks like, a, I don't know what it's it is. It's literally a lion's head and a pitchfork. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and you don't think that. No. Yeah. And so what do you think of instead? You just, I think a luxury. Luxury. That's right. And what makes you think about luxury? What else do you think about besides luxury? You think? I think of like. By the way, I've never it, stayed at a Ritz. I like don't know if events you have. You fancy. And I think of. I mean, I just think of you know service. Perfect. The two <laughs> things that come up the most: luxury and experience or service, yeah. right? Well, and that's because crackers. I just think no, crackers. You think crackers? <laughs> I you would. <laughs> <laughs> you would. <laughs> I'm hungry. Spoken like a true eight-year-old, um, but. But that's what brand is most of the time is brand is how people experience their um, encounter with you. It is how they how uh, they remember your business. It is it is oftentimes um, their actual interpretation of either the peak experience they had, positive or negative, or what they've heard from other people. Because I've not stayed at a Ritz. I don't know if you have I either of you. No. Right. So none of us have stayed there. So none of us actually know whether it's luxury or whether they have great service. Yet that's what we're told from everyone else. So that's our perception of the brand. And yet most people 
uh, especially when we think about um, small businesses and entrepreneurs, they're actually uh, conflating brand as to something that it is not. Right. But I find that brand for most entrepreneurs is actually just their own ego. They think that their name, their business likeness or something um, affiliated with them is the brand. It's yet, premium. It's the, not. It's not. It's yeah. the experience. It's Absolutely. what people think of when they think of you. So going back to Rich, Rich Carl or whatever. Rich, yeah. Um, so they have the, the idea, like when you think of them, you think of them as luxury. You think of them as the the. The part is, how do you get your business to do that? How do you get that image in people's minds in a, in a way that they say the Forney group or the Herd yeah. group or Thrive Real Estate or whatever, that they can, they can associate your brand? That's right. So how do you do that? Well, it's interesting because um, that's really the thesis of what we're talking about is this what are all of the little micro events or the uh, micro experiences that lead to that overarching um, brand recognition or brand experience? And so, you know, in, in, in the Ritz Carlton's perspective, you know, it's, it starts uh, with, with the environment. And, and that's because most of the time in leadership, one of the, one of the things that gets discounted when we look at the picture of success is the, the invisible hand of the environment. And the environment is so often shapes the outcome of our life and our business, uh, and yet we overlook it, right? Is uh, the easiest way to uh, equate this in my house is um, if the environment has cookies in it, I will eat them. If the environment does not have cookies in them, I do not eat cookies. Right. And so whether it is that simple, that is the invisible hand that shapes what I, what I choose to eat. Okay. And, and when we think about it in business, it's, it's oftentimes very similar and yet slightly more complex in that if you have a productivity centric environment, okay. you build productivity because that becomes your culture. And so that looks like, um, are people, um, showing up in a, in a sales environment, like the Wolf of Wall Street the, as a movie is a great example of what a productivity centric environment might look like. Now, of course, they got went a little too far one direction, but understand that at least like when you when you wrap your head around the visual of a productivity centric environment, it's more than one person in the boat rowing, doing the activity and creating that synergy um, right. inside of an environment. That energy or that synergy of an activity done by more than one person is infectious. Yeah, we know that to be true because movements always start with one person and one follower. Yeah. When the follower is the one who's actually taking the biggest risk, the first follower, and then everyone else that joins after that becomes a movement. So I think Martin Luther King, right? It, Martin Luther King gets all the credit for the movement and arguably rightfully so. Yet somebody had to agree to fo be the first follower. Yeah. And everyone else then follow later. Right. And so, uh, that, and that is actually the byproduct of an environment. Yeah. It, Martin Luther King gets the credit. The environment was all of the people converging together to build on that energy, to create that movement. And in the in, in, as far as an environment, that's the easiest thing for you to change as well. So yeah. like, if you're not in an environment that is conducive, to what it is that you're trying to do. For example, if you're, if you have a home office and it's chaotic at home, separate yourself. That's what you're saying with the cookies. Yeah, that's right. If you're trying to run a business, uh, make sure that you're in an environment that's going to, I mean, as simple as it is your chair, simple as your desk. If you're fighting against that, it's all, I know you guys, if any of you guys listen to this, it's the energy that over time, if you're yep. in that situation. So, so, I mean, if you go back and when I think about how does a, how does a real estate team owner or a business owner extrapolate what we said into tangible, tactical um, application, um, you know, I, I think about 
if you if you go back to our culture episode, it has a lot to do with uh, environment, has to do with with culture, and the tactics of culture shape the environment. And so, by that I mean, when we think about culture, it is um, it is not just like how we how we act and interact. It's also symbols and language and visuals yeah. and routines and rituals and um, and traditions. And so, inside of a business, you, um, you have visuals that create cues that also shape the environment, right? So like when I, when, when I go into our office, everyone has at their desk, their a picture of their vision board and their goals. Um, and, and then the, what their goal is, what reality is, what the gap is. I know that in everyone's office, they have roughly the same visual that triggers productivity and triggers focus so that it is, well, it, it compounds. Each teammate knows what everyone else's goals are and where they are. Yeah. And then each person is reminded by their own goals by looking at them right. on a regular basis. That environment shapes an outcome. And so we've really noticed that, especially Mike, when because you know, we've done this like four team like merger mm-hmm. and it is work and it is going incredibly well. And we also see differing outcomes yeah, you see us versus them yeah you kick the snot out of them <laughs> yeah. if you, go, you foster competition we you do you do and what's interesting too has been that um the people have placed uh, those that are like disproportionately outperforming or outproducing other members of the company um th- those that are not performing at the highest level oftentimes attribute success to the wrong attributes yeah. or to the wrong activities. Yeah. They don't see the invisible hand of the environment if they're not showing up in that environment. So the easiest way to like for me is I'm sorry if I cut you off. No, you're good. Um is like if you can break down this is the thing. I think we focus on like the big thing. Absolutely. And if you can break that down into smaller manageable things that you can do on a consistent basis, those are the things that are like success is not sexy. No, it's not. It's crazy how mundane and how it's a literally a habit. Yeah. And so figuring out what those habits are, and then taking action on those ab- habits, measuring, and then adjusting. So, I mean, the agents that are out doing that and they're out do- and the problem is we say lead generate, but we mm-hmm. don't say what lead generating That's right. is. That's right. Yeah. We say the word, like this big word, and we don't get specific as in, Every day I do this amount of how many phone calls I make. I talk to have this many conversations. I follow up in this way, et cetera, and so forth. We say lead generate. Yeah. And and so that's what I, what you said was, um, that success is boring. And by that it consistency breeds trust and success. Right. And, and, what I, what I think about that, I think about the fact, yeah, absolutely. When I, when I think about, um, trust, um, you know, I always use this example that, that goes, Hey Tyler, when you, um, when you sat down on that chair, did you test it out and make sure that it was, um, able to hold your weight? And did you check the manufacturer, like a sticker underneath to ensure that it could handle your, you know, 150 pounds or whatever. And, um, did, did you incrementally add weight to it to ensure that you, when you sat down, you wouldn't fall or did you just not think about it and sit down? I went through the checklist. Actually. <laughs> That's right. You went through the pre pre sit <laughs> checklist, right? I- and I've been known to, sm- to smash chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and so because, because you, you sat down without thinking about it, the reason that we are able to sit down without thinking about it and worrying about whether a chair will, will collapse is because consistently time over time, that chair holds up our weight and therefore we sit down subconsciously without ever thinking about it. Right. That is trust. You trusted that the chair would hold up your weight because consistently it's done so in the past that's what leadership looks like as well that's what shaping an organization and environment looks like is how do you consistently show up in order to create 
whatever the environment is or whatever the culture is that you're hoping to drive. That consistency is what actually matters arguably more than anything. Absolutely. In a time when, uh, uh, you know, um, there's a momentum shift or there's disruption in your business, um, you have to be able to lean on those. And if we haven't measured that and you don't. So I was I was sharing with you guys before we got on um, we when the pandemic hit, um, I do a certain number of activities uh, every day. And when I say activities, I make phone calls. I want to be specific. So every day I make 40 to 50 phone calls every day. And by making 300 phone calls, I'll have five, five appointments and I should write a contract. But then when the pandemic hit, I was doing those same activities and my results tanked. So I thought, OK, I can either uh, do the exact same results uh, and be OK making less money or I can double my activities. I doubled my activities. I then started getting the appointments, which led to contracts. So by me being able to measure that. Uh, I was able to extrapolate that based on my business being disrupted. So what I heard you say was, is have a dashboard and, and monitor the dashboard to know um, what the speed of the engine is, whether the check engine light is on, um, whether yeah. you have low tire pressure um, or, or whether you're redlining your business, right? Is have a dashboard of, um, things that matter to to your business and then focus on it right because when you when you have that dashboard consistently over time you know when something is is you can see I, trends that's right you're you're identifying <laughs> patterns in order to try to predict the future right, right. and then now i know okay y'all we got to pivot like we got to make more phone calls or you know one thing that's how i'm able to you know i'm with buyers and sellers I'm able to say, OK, I need to focus on getting more sellers because, you know, you could just see trends in, in your models and everything that you're doing every day. Yeah. And I think about it as in God, we trust and in everything else. We should trust data. Yeah, right? it is because without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Yeah. And so the dashboard and the data should drive a lot of the decision making, truly. And, and that's one of the challenges is that most of the time we operate from soft skills. Yeah. Rather than operating from the data. Right. And so um, it's the challenge that that entrepreneurs have is that even the concept of being an entrepreneur is oftentimes um, someone who acts um, in a in a in a disruptive or uncontrolled um, in in somewhat chaotic manner. And that only works up to a certain point in your business right. in which case then you have to think about being systems solution driven instead of problem solving focused um, or you have to stop being entrepreneurial and start being system based one of the key pillars of having a system is measuring what matters right and then yeah. and then checking that and so I think about one of the things that matters disproportionately, one of the tiny levers that creates big results in a business is being systems solution thinking instead of problem solving base. And that's because, you know, we see it so often in real estate, especially where um, where the agent will drop what they're doing to um, to satisfy an angry client. And yet spend no time crafting a solution to prevent upset clients in general. Yeah. It, you know, um, if you're, you end up being very, putting out a lot of fires versus like being proactive. So if something happens, put a system in place so that it doesn't happen again. Right. And then another thing you were saying earlier, OK, we go to our doctor's office, we have vital signs. Yeah. There's certain things that they're looking for. You you don't want your doctor to have soft skills and be like, ah, your blood, it's 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 OK. Like you want to know my blood pressure is this. My yeah. vital signs are this. So when you're running your business, this is another thing. OK, you'll start seeing things happening. The problem is. The problem doesn't manifest 
until right. 90 That's down, right. um, days down the road. Yeah. So if you don't, if you start seeing something happen, you mm -hmm. got to fix it then because it doesn't hit you then. Yeah. It hits you in 90 days. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> perfect example of that is in 90 days, it may be even longer, right? Yeah. I, had, I had an event happen in my business in August of one year that finally blew up in March the next year. <laughs> I could have, I, I believe I could have done something differently to prevent that future problem in August when the actual like initial catalyst event took place. Right. That I let probably linger or last too long that eventually just compounded to blow yeah. up in March. Yeah. And, and that contributed to a significant loss of income, revenue, et cetera. And, and that's because it was tiny little micro events compounded on a, on a weekly basis that finally led to a large scale event that I should have gotten way out in front of months prior. Yeah. And it can, it can cost you your business. So you have to, by having those vital signs, I did not, I remember going to my coach and I remember saying to my coach, I want to feel like a business person. I want to feel like I'm like an entrepreneur. I didn't start really truly feeling like an entrepreneur until I started understanding the certain vital signs and the trends in my business. And now I can look at these spreadsheets and like, we need to focus on listings because at, we're going to have a terrible first quarter if we don't. But the ability to be able to look and be predictive versus reactive is to me is what that corner was, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that when we, when we, when we shift, to a focus on systems based solutions instead of problem solving that we end up actually building a business because eventually the system always gets us the outcome it was designed for right right is when you when you sit down at your computer and you type on the keys the key, that system that keyboard that that computer system that operating system gives you the exact output it was designed to give you right. your business works very similarly. The challenge is that people don't recognize that it is a human energy system. Yeah. It's a machine. That's right. It is a machine of human energy. Yep. And therefore we have to create a system for it. There has to be boundaries and guardrails. There has to be, um, a, a lot of oversight and there has to be, uh, a number of different built in mechanisms to um, get a particular outcome. I always use the example that says, like when you, when you go to a boxing gym, there's not a squat rack. A boxing gym is designed, the system is designed to box in. It is not designed to be treated like a hit style cardio right. beatbox gym. <laughs> right. That is different. Floyd Mayweather does not do supersets between you know haymakers and, and squat rack. Right because the system always gets what it's designed for as an output. And, and therefore I think we should be thinking about building a system for an outcome. And yet that is so unsexy. Yeah. It is so incredibly unsexy. And yet Bill Belichick got a drastically different result in new England than he got in Cleveland when he was the head coach of the Browns. Nick Saban was his assistant coach. Nick Saban seems to have a pretty good system in Alabama. He sure does. So here's two guys yeah. who have uh, a pretty damn good track record, yet were fired while coaching for the Cleveland Browns. Right. The difference is the system. Yeah. It, and that's been a shift for you, Mike. What, when, I, when, you, when I say systems for business or for a real estate team, what comes to mind for you? Um, so... When I get into my car, I push the brake and I hit the little start button and it does something. And that leads to a, the piston firing and, and all that good stuff. It's a system. Your car is a system. When I go into McDonald's, I pull up and I ask for whatever my order is. That goes into a tool. Then the person takes that information, relays it to the back. And every time I get the same result, regardless, I'm in California or I'm here in Indianapolis. To me, your business has to run that way. You get the lead, 
your team is focused on the day-to-day task in order to convert that lead that then ends to result, which is a happy homeowner or a happy seller. Yeah. So you have to, you have to be able to digest and take the a complicated things such as buying and selling a real estate. And you have to have other people within your organization do specialized parts of that. That sounds complicated, but it's not. It's not. It no. really isn't. You no, just have to focus on the habits every day. I lead generate. I make phone calls. Those phone calls are going to appointments. And then you just have to do it. And then you have to have a, be in an environment where it's productivity based. And then you're coaching people on best practices. And what I heard you say is that if business is a human energy system that processes are what conserves energy and because processes give predictability. We know that yeah. predictability reduces the amount of energy that's expended. And so systems and processes create predictability, which reduce the amount of energy expended. The human energy system, the business operates precisely that way. And yet processes and systems are some of the most unsexy things that nobody ever talks nobody about. Nobody wants to hear it. That's no, right. Like nobody wants to hear it. That's, Mike, what do you do? This is what I do every day. They're like, They're, you got, you can't be just doing that. That's what I do. And so what people do is they focus on social media. They focus on the headlines. When in all reality, before all that was there, what was I doing? Doing the activities that led me to the point where you can do the stuff on social media. From a leadership perspective, what's one of the most unsexy things that you do as far as a process goes that you attribute to your success as a leader oh that's easy um have communication and by that i mean um if it's human if it's a human energy system um where where trust minimizes the energy expenditure i have to have trust with people inside of an organization which means we have to communicate in order to build trust. That consistency of communication builds trust. And so by that, I mean, uh, think about it. Let's, ex- let's extract ourselves from business and think about our relationships, right? As we all have, we all have spouses that if we don't communicate consistently or talk or spend any time in dialogue, we don't have a relationship at some point, which yeah. means we're Rest not, down. We're, not we're, we're not in business in life together anymore. Yeah. And so truly the, the communication is the relationship and the relationship is what builds the trust. The, the communication builds the trust and the relationship. And so for me, it's having a pattern and a habit of consistently having structured communication with everyone who's inside of that like span of control, because I've, I've worked with leaders who don't, and I've worked with leaders who do, I can tell you that personally somebody who's in in relationship and in communication with the people that that like in theory report to me when i've been a direct report for someone else and not been in communication we're not in relationship yeah we do not thrive we do not have synergy and success because we don't understand each other we don't even know each other if a leader doesn't know how to motivate me or how to how to um get a result the only thing they're doing is flying blindly in 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 a fog and so knowing your people and what what their levers and buttons are it, it, by being in dialogue with them is in my opinion single-handedly the most important thing to do so let me pose the the reverse to you mike that says mm-hmm. um you you have a an almost three-year-old how do you know when she needs your attention and when she needs to be in time out or punishment or in trouble or whatever that is. Right. How do you know when she needs a hug or when she needs a kick in the butt? Uh, well, I have not the best to ask that. Cause I, <laughs> cause it, no, I mean, they all, I mean, she cries, she tries to communicate to you in the, in the best way that she can. And it's, if you are unable to communicate or spend enough time with her, sometimes a whine will be, I'm tired. And then she whines a different way when she's hungry. And I, and because I'm around her so much, I'm able to dis- distinct, you know, tell the difference on which one it That's is. That's right. That's right. That's the biggest difference That's, is we make this so much harder than it is. Yeah, it's not. Because truly, like, 
what you just said was is that it is intuitive yeah <laughs> by spending time with her you learn yeah. the patterns of her own behavior and you can then adapt and give grace mm -hmm. or or give consequence right whichever is required that, that's that's <laughs> right whatever whatever is needed to yeah. be um the best version is what you're able to adapt and provide once you've spent enough time and once you've built up that like consistency of relationship because you've you've spent the time together i mean listen we we've spent all spent enough time together we don't need to necessarily like communicate on a daily basis in order to like understand the dynamic of the relationship it also doesn't mean that if we don't hit some sort of like indifference patch that we might not need to like communicate it in order to resolve it you need to make it a priority that's right that's right and so where le where often where i see leaders and have encountered leaders that have failed in this is that communicating with direct reports is not a priority and if you're unwilling to do it on the front end or if you think it's something that you can leverage out or just disregard okay. and, and not um, do the due diligence on the front end of understanding the person, there is no free lunch. You'll, right. you'll pay for that later because you won't understand how to motivate, how to drive, how to inspire that person later. And when you get stuck, you'll likely push the wrong button or fire the wrong lever. Right. Knowing the person intuitively will give you a different outcome so by when i hear this what i hear is you need to make relationships with people that you work that work with you a priority absolutely absolutely because i mean it, it's a business is, is human energy it's human capital if you think about investing your time the the single biggest return on time is oftentimes how you invest human capital Right. Right. And so in, if if the best thing you can do for return on time is invest human capital, then you actually have to show up and invest the time right. into the human yeah. in order to get the capital. Yeah. And, you know, I think about like a, a recent leader that I that I worked with who um, would oftentimes center conversations with me around money. Doesn't inspire me doesn't motivate me, doesn't cause any different change. You can't motivate me with punishment. We've talked about this on podcasts yeah, before. Yeah. You recognize that yeah. before we ever had the discussion. And so you can actually. It'll get, turn you off. It'll probably right. piss you, you off. That's right. You can get a different outcome with me, yeah. but it won't be by talking about money or talking about consequences. Yeah, right. You'll but be it, like, okay, and that's you'll, right. you'll literally will run into it. That's right. And <laughs> so knowing that yeah. because we ha were in relationship before allows you then to go, okay, I need to create a different solution, a right. different proposal. I need to, instead of running head on, like I'm a fullback, I need to do an end around sweep and try a different approach in order to get the outcome that I seek. That's what leadership is. It's managing human energy. You have seven kids, right? Yeah. Eight. They, eight. Okay. You forgot they, one. They do not all operate all and, and inspire and motivate and act the same way. That's right. They all take a different approach. Yeah. And as a parent, you have to know that. That's leadership. Yeah. And you have to. So if you guys want to take this another way is from if you guys are leading people, like right now, you don't have a crew or a team. This also applies to your database. This also applies when I say relationships with the people you work with, yeah. you got to make that a priority by like, it's almost like lead generating. It's the same thing. You time block to have those relationships and to communicate Absolutely. with people. So yeah. on the other end, if you're not lead, you're leading, you need to lead generate with your database in order to have relation, be in relationship with your clients so that when they're ready to buy or sell, you've already got the relationship. That's all lead generating is. That's right. You have to leads need leaders. Yeah. And, and you have to lead those leads. It's the same thing. You can have do a process. This way. That's you can right. go this way. You can go sideways. And that's right. And so just by taking the time in order to foster and develop that relationship, that's where that's what Eric has figured out five years ago and made him a lot of money. Yeah. And I it's interesting because I still un, oftentimes don't understand how others don't understand this. And and part of part of it is I think that there's oftentimes a bias 
towards simplicity and speed in entrepreneurs. And they also hate. They're like, they just say, oh, that dude's lucky. Like, instead well, of just true. going yeah. back and saying, what is that dude doing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and when you try to unpack it, when you look at it and think about, like, what what is um, what we see is oftentimes not actually what the what caused the no. outcome of what we see. You know, last week, um, you know, I, I'm I'm in an incredibly fortunate perspective position and i don't know how i got here but i'm in, but i'm in a really uh, incredibly fortunate position to you know spend a lot of time with adam um who i mean in theories that like we just strip it down to what it is the number three agent in the in the world number four whatever we look at uh, um and runs it's pretty you know, badass a, a billion plus dollar <laughs> um um company yeah and um and then recently i spent um some time with another billionaire affiliated with the company and the two biggest takeaways i have with both of them is is how kind they are honestly how how much they care about people and serving people yeah. instead of serving themselves and that shapes the leadership i'm blown away by how um by how much Gary tr genuinely cares and how kind he is in person, but that's not the version that you see necessarily on stage at an Inman conference, talking with Brad Inman or uh, right. on a mega camp or a family reunion. Right. And yet every encounter I've had, that's been the single bit most surprising thing to me is, is how, um, how genuinely human and how much he actually seems to care. Why do you think that is important? Because if you don't, if you don't care about people, you can't lead them. Yeah. Because then you're only care because you only care about leading yourself at that point. Right. Yeah. Is you're only leading someone as a means to an end. Right. And at a certain point that can work for a short period of time. Like dictatorships work during wartime. Eventually democracy sets in, however, because you can you can only lead someone for your own best interest or purely from a missional perspective until you achieve the mission or until a certain amount of time expires because it it extracts a huge amount of energy from each person from the system if they're not being recharged by doing something that they're passionate about yeah. with people that they're also care about and are passionate about yeah and so th they have I think that those are two people who understood that at first you can start out with piss and vinegar and competitiveness, but eventually there has to be a shift to sustainability. Yeah. And that sustainability is, is serving people and also deploying everything that you learn during the piss and vinegar stage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, servant leadership, um, the, the ultimate servant leader, um, you know, me being Christian, even though I cuss, I say that, um, <laughs> Jesus, like he, yeah. it was, a, he was a servant leader. So that's the model that I choose to follow. Uh, and it seems to be, it seems to work, you know, for me, if, if I can help enough people, I know this is cliche, uh, you know, if I can help get them their blessings, then I'll be blessed as well. And so, uh, if you can focus on other people, you get better results than if you were just f focusing and you were just an individual and doing yourself. So um, that's kind of the way that I go. All right, as we tie a bow on this here, when we think about um, not confusing the headlines for the story, I want to I want to kind of walk back and think about and and wrap up what we talked about. So we talked that consistency breeds trust, right? Whatever you do consistently is what shows up in your business, and that. Uh, you have to fly with the dashboard. You have to look at the vital signs of your business because the vital signs and the dashboard, whatever you measure in data likely shows up in your future. Um, you have to think system solutions instead of problem solving. Uh, you have to reverse engineer your successes. Don't focus on all of your failures. Those are the easiest things to look at. Yet focus on the things that you've won at. And when you were winning, why were you succeeding? What was causing those successes? And then focus on what's most important. And what's most important in the human energy system is, is to know your people. And by knowing your people on the front end and then in a processed and consistent manner, 
allows you to as allows you to lead that human energy system to whatever it is your desired outcome is or whatever mission you're going on but you have to know them first in order to love them